Good morning. Welcome to CMC Markets on Friday, the 26th of February, and this quick look at the week ahead beginning the 1st of March. Before we get started on that, just get through um, the various risk warnings before we get on to the discussion. Well, not so much a discussion, but my look back at the events of the past few days, because I think if anything, um, this week can be characterised by, I think, a single question whether an increase in rates or yields is good for stock markets or bad for stock markets. Certainly, I think in the context of the discussions that central bankers have been having this week, they would argue that higher rates are a broad reflection of an improving economic outlook and thus should actually be um, fairly positive for stock markets. But as we well know and have known for the past 10 years or so, the economy is not stock markets and the stock markets isn't the economy. So just because the stock market's doing well doesn't necessarily mean that the economy is doing well. And if the economy is doing well, you could conceivably argue that the stock market might do not as well as maybe it should have been doing, say, for example, five or 10 years ago, simply because central bankers might be inclined to pull away some of the, some of the monetary policy support that they've been putting in over the course of the past 12 years. So this is where we currently are with respect to stock markets. I think it's important to remember that even though um, we've seen an awful lot of choppiness this week and stock markets have tried to go up, they've tried to go down, and really this week haven't ended up going really anywhere, I think there is a concern about over frothy valuations at a time when particularly US Treasury yields and UK gilt yields have come an awful long way in a very short space of time. And I think that more than anything is what is spooking the markets. If you look at where UK gilt yields were, for example, at the beginning of this year, they're around about 0.2%. They're now, they're now 0.75. So that's 55 basis points above where they started the year. If you look at US Treasuries, Treasury yields, it's been a similar sort of story. They were around about 0.91% at the beginning of 2021, and they're now at 1.5%, so 60 basis points higher. With most of that rise in yields coming in this month of February, which we are now coming to the back end of, with the 1st of March beginning on Monday. So I think more than anything, it's not so much the fact that rates are going up, but it's the speed that they're going up. And you've got a stimulus plan, a US stimulus plan that's due to be pushed through um, uh, the US Congress over the course of the next week or so, an extra $1.9 trillion on top of the $900 billion that we saw pushed through at the beginning of January. And I think there's a, there's a perception or a fear that maybe um, the fiscal side is probably doing too much lifting and you could see an economic surge over the course of the next six months because we're certainly not going to get it over the next three because um, restrictions will still be in place. And I think one thing that we can, well, I think one thing that we can um acknowledge over the course of the past few days is the massive rise that we've seen in copper prices from uh, where we were at the beginning of this year now there does appear to be some evidence potentially that copper may have topped out now if copper has topped out that could potentially be bad news for stock markets because if we look at the way stock markets have gone this year and we are still up for February. So despite all the volatility that we've seen this week, February is still set to be a positive month for the FTSE, the DAX and the S&P, despite all the hysteria about the big declines that we've seen um, this week, we're still up on the month. Nonetheless, Canary in the coal mine could be a potential reversal in copper and a key day reversal on the daily chart. So I'll be paying particular attention to the copper price in the context of whether or not we can go higher in stock markets. Now, there could be a divergence starting to take place, but we've seen big gains 
also in other base metal prices on the basis that um, we're going to see a significant shortfall in supply relative to demand for all those renewables um, that the copper that copper is going to be used in, in terms of batteries, electric cars, solar panels, wind turbines, anything that conducts an electric current. Also seen Brent prices um, move higher over the course of the past few weeks. You can certainly see that here, just shy of $70 a barrel. Um, $66 a barrel, I think, has been the high. We've got an OPEC meeting coming up over the course of the next few days. In fact, I think it's next Thursday. And this is something, again, that we need to be aware of. At the moment, OPEC Plus has been broadly in agreement about keeping the production curbs exactly where they are to basically try and pinch off too much supply. Now that prices are above $60 a barrel, you can see some cracks start to open up between some of the smaller countries who want to take advantage of higher prices by pumping out more oil into the market. And that could well act as a headwind for crude oil prices over the course of the next few days and weeks. That would also be welcome for inflation expectations. If we start to see evidence of a topping out in commodity prices, which have been which are back at levels last seen in 2011, 2012, particularly where copper is concerned. So those are the two things, two key, two key commodities that I'll be paying attention to over the course of the next week or so. It's also a big week for macro. Um, we've got non-farm payrolls coming up. Before I come on to that, let's have a quick look at the FTSE 100, as we can see. Um, Despite the choppiness of the past few days, we haven't really broken out of the range that we've been in um, since the beginning of February. Um, we're still above the lows, and even though we've come down from the highs in the middle of the month, we have the middle of the month, we actually haven't come down too far. And actually, we found support um, every day this week around about 65.40. So, based on that, um, the downside for the FTSE 100 at the moment. Uh, looks fairly limited. And why do I say that? Given that I'm concerned about highs in copper and um, oil prices. Well, ultimately, while the FTSE 100 is very um, susceptible to moves in copper and crude oil prices, it's also not a complete proxy for them. Um, one of the one of the key one of the key um, beneficiaries of the past week or so has been banks. Um, from a much steeper yield curve. We've also seen travel and leisure pick up quite significantly over the course of the past few days. And we've also seen retailers pick up as well. And the FTSE 100 has an awful lot of them. So I think overall, the FTSE 100, my bias for the FTSE 100 still remains more positive than negative. And I don't expect crude oil prices or copper prices to come crashing off. But what I do expect to see is a little bit of consolidation at these higher levels which in the short to medium term should well be positive for the FTSE 100. It's certainly, I certainly don't expect to see it um, below this trend line that I've drawn in through here um, from these lows here. But 65.40 in the short term, still expecting to see a retest of potentially these, these series of peaks all the way through here. So let's draw in a little trend line for here, go through there. So that's my next trend line resistance on the FTSE 100, looking for a retest of that over the course of the next few days. Similar sort of story for the German DAX. Again here, daily chart. Yes, we have made marginal new lows, but what I think is significant about this particular chart here is that every time we've gone lower, these long lower shadows would appear to suggest that there's fairly decent demand anywhere near 13,600. In a similar way, there was fairly decent demand all the way over here um, when we dipped back below to this level here. And even though we spiked below that and the 50 day moving average on these three or four days here, that move lower proved to be fairly short lived simply because it wasn't followed through by similar down moves in equity markets elsewhere. S&P 500, same thing here, very much in the uptrend that we've been in over the course of the past few days and weeks. If we look at the weekly chart to see whether or not the candles are telling us anything there, not so much, certainly a little bit of a rollover. 
may well see a retest of 3,600. But I think if we are going to see a correction in equity markets, then I think the, the bigger correction is going to come in US markets rather than, rather than European markets more broadly. The NASDAQ, I think, is going to be very important in the overall scheme of things. This 12,700 level here, which thus far has held, but um, is acting as a very, very key support, and we have broken below the 50-day moving average. So the NASDAQ is flashing red. It's flashing some warning signs about further upside going forward. And certainly here, the weekly charts are suggesting that we could see a little bit of a correction lower, particularly if the economic recovery story continues to gain traction, because I think some of the key beneficiaries of the pandemic have been stocks ultimately and companies that ultimately that don't generate an awful lot of profits, but obviously do and have um, been very, very good in terms of growth over the course of the last few months. Companies like Peloton um, and Zoom, um, and who, and who I will be basically looking at as part of my look at the week ahead. Um, other companies like, Net, like Netflix as well um, could well suffer as a result, as, particularly as we head into the summer and the weather improves, they may well find their subscriber numbers drop off simply because people won't and be staying in, they'll be going out, and obviously looser restrictions will mean less eyes um, on streaming uh, platforms. So again, you could see a little bit of softness there. So looking ahead to the week ahead, we've got US payrolls, which are due out on the Friday. We've got services PMIs, they're going to be very important in the context of how um, the the economy is doing, and it's not going to be any surprise to know that there is going to be a continued weakness in Europe. We've got the US beige book, we've got the UK budget. Now, I'm going to devote a little bit of time to the UK budget simply because of how the pound has performed over the course of the past few weeks. We are starting to see some signs of a little bit of a reversal in the pound from the levels that we saw all the way back at the beginning of the year, but also from what we saw back in September. And I have published a piece on the budget, which can be found in the insights section, the news and analysis section, where I talk about what Rishi Sunak may be looking to do as we look ahead to next Wednesday. But I think more importantly, I think the pressure will be on for him to do no harm. What he's going to be doing, looking to do, is plot the road to recovery. So while we've seen a little bit of a reversal in the pound at the moment, we could see further declines going forward. We could see a move back to 138.20 and this 50-day moving average through here and 137.12, these series of highs through here, which prompted the break higher. I think we could well see a retest of that, but it doesn't change my overall view that we will see the pound continue to push higher over the course of the next few months. The UK still leads Europe and the US in its vaccination program. And assuming that the Chancellor of the Exchequer doesn't do anything stupid, then we, we will probably see a furlough extension in the coming week. And that's one area that's proving to be extremely expensive and is due to end in April. We could well see the cut in VAT to 5% extended. That is due to expire at the end of March. I think it's I think it would be foolhardy in the extreme if he were to raise VAT all the way back to that 20% level at a time when aviation, restaurants, bars and other leisure venues have yet to reopen. And I think that is a worry going forward. I think the support measures for those particular sectors will continue to have to stay in place for the foreseeable future. Either that, or he could well come up with a whole new tax regime for a sector that is likely to take a very long time to recover, because something like that just can't be dreamed up on the hoof. So these are the areas that I think are going to need an awful lot of um, tweaking 
shall we say. And I think that's, and they could well get extended into the middle of the summer and we could have another budget in November when hopefully the economic outlook will be that much clearer. I think we do need to look at long-term solutions. It is a time for long-term solutions. And I think while it's entirely right to be concerned about the level of the current deficit, borrowing costs are still fairly low. I mean, the government can afford to be creative when it comes to timeframes in terms of closing the gap when it comes to plugging the tax and spend. Um, the, 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 the tax and spend gap. Um, he could look at new he could look at new long term funding or savings vehicles. That would be one area. Fifty year bonds, infrastructure bonds could be another area the government could look at. Extending the debt profile of UK borrowing. UK already has the longest remake payment profile in its terms of its peers at over ten years. Other countries are looking at fifty year bonds. Um, Austria, Belgium, and Ireland have issued hundred year bonds, so called century bonds. You could encourage um, people with some savings to put them in national savings and investments. They cut the interest rate on that, which at a time when government needs money and excess savings seems a remarkably short sighted thing to do. So there's any number of things that the Chancellor could do. So ultimately, I think when we look at the pound, um, the outlook will continue to be fairly positive. We look at this candle here and it does appear to suggest that we could well be overdue a little bit of a pullback in the short to medium term. And as such, I would be very, very cautious of being about overly long and sterling as we head into the budget. Um, similar sort of story when it comes to euro sterling. If we look at this euro sterling chart here, there's a potential hammer on the daily chart there with this very strong upper thrust candle here. That suggests that we are probably overdue a little bit of a short squeeze back to 88, maybe even the 50 day moving average all the way up there around about 88, 60, 88, 70. But I'm still of the opinion that euro sterling is likely to go lower, but we could well be due a little bit of a pullback in the short to medium term. OK, so I think that's about as much time as I'm going to devote to the UK budget. It's it's going to be very, very important. Uh, but in the overall scheme of things, I think more important than anything else is that the hope is the Chancellor won't do any harm. He might announce a rise in corporation tax. Uh, that's currently at 19%. He could push it up to 20, 21%. Um, but it, that may take effect from next year. It could be that he will signpost a rise in corporation tax rather than bringing it in straight away. So in politics, Sometimes optics is everything. And while he can afford to be generous now, he can start signposting tax increases further down the line. And certainly corporation tax is a tax on profits. If you're not making any profits, you don't pay any tax. I mean, Amazon plays that game very, very well. Um, anyway, because it siphons its profits out of the UK. Um, so digressing ever so slightly there. So that's the budget on the 3rd of March. Um, we've also got US payrolls and the dollar, the performance of the dollar in recent days has been fairly interesting. What's been notable is that we actually haven't taken out these previous lows through here. So the dollar has consistently tried to push lower, but what it hasn't been able to do is to take out the previous lows that we've seen in the CMC dollar index here. And I think that's the very, very, I think that's the key thing to keep an eye out for. People talk about dollar weakness an awful lot. And it's very keen, they're very, very keen to ride off the dollar. But every time we threaten to break lower, we get a nice little pull higher. And we've got what it looks like a bit of a bullish reversal here, which suggests again that we could see further dollar upside. If that's the case, then the euro may well find it's very, very difficult to go higher. And if we look at euro dollar, we had a little bit of a false break on the daily chart here above the 50 day moving average. Long upper shadow there suggests that the area above 122 is very, very thin. As such, we're probably going to get another downward thrust, perhaps towards 
um, the 12060 area, which again is very fairly key support going forward. So if we get a retest of 126070, we could go, we could well get a retest of 119 and a half. Certainly, I think a stronger currency is not necessarily a bad thing. And one thing I think that um, the resilience of the euro has done is it will limit inflation, CPI inflation. And while that's probably a bad thing for Europe because their rates are negative, it's probably not such a bad thing for the UK because it certainly makes import inflation that much more difficult to filter through. So um, certainly in terms of the overall inflation outlook, um, a higher pound is probably going to take some of the edge off any move higher in headline CPI. So that's euro dollar for you. So looking ahead to US payrolls, I'll be hosting a webinar, usual time, um, next week, uh, 1.15 onwards for half an hour to 45 minutes. And the thing about this payrolls number is it's going to be important in the wider scheme of things in terms of how well the US jobs market is starting to recover. Now, just as a quick recap on that, what we've seen um, is up until the December number, we saw second, seven consecutive months of job gains, job, job, job gains, and they came to a shuddering halt in December. The US economy shed 227,000 jobs at the end of last year, and the ADP report was also negative. Now, since then, in January, we've seen and a decent, a fairly decent recovery. Now, the prospects of further fiscal support on top of the 900 billion past the beginning of January also bails well. We saw January payrolls rebound with 49,000 new jobs added. The unemployment rate fell quite sharply to 6.3% in December. I'm not really paying too much attention to that because of the because of the low participation rate. Nonetheless, you would hope that as the vaccination program rolls out across the US, US businesses become much more optimistic about the outlook going forward. And that's where the beige book will come in. And that's obviously coming out on the 3rd of March as well. So it's going to be quite a busy day. Um, look, for, look, for, look for signs of positivity in the beige book. Um, but more importantly, I think, look at the underemployment rate. At the moment, that's currently sitting at 11.1% still well below the April peak last year of 22.8 um, and it's still well above the low which we saw at the end of 2019 when it was at 6.7 so as I say virus cases are falling hospitalizations are falling deaths are falling mercifully um, across the US and I think that's playing a part in the rise in optimism now expectations are for 133,000 new jobs to be added in February and weekly jobless claims are still trending between seven or eight hundred thousand. Um, so they're they're down from the peak that we saw um, around about nine hundred and fifty at the beginning of January. So the hope is that December is the low point or an aberration, and that subsequent months we'll see a continuation of the gains that we saw in January. We're still well below the levels of unemployment um, or the number of jobs that we lost in the months of March and April last year that was 21 and a half million we've only added back around about half that number so while the headline unemployment number looks fairly low at 6.3 6.4 relative to where it was you have to remember that that does not include people who've given up looking for work and have dropped out of the workforce there's also been a more than two percent drop in the participation rate as well but nonetheless, it's about the direction of travel. And the hope is that we'll get an upward revision to January, but we'll also see a fairly positive February number, given some of the data that's been coming out on the ISMs, manufacturing services ISMs, and what have you. So keep an eye on the services PMIs or the services ISMs for the US, also on the third. Look for a pickup in UK services. PMIs and as well because we saw a nice little pickup in the flash number um, when it came out um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, the fact is the UK is already talking about a roadmap 
out of lockdown, unlike France and Germany. And that will, I think, continue to help underpin the pound going forward. OK, so that's um, that's the major currencies that we've looked at. Let's now have a quick look at uh, some of the companies that are reporting their full year numbers next week in housing market very much in focus certainly certainly potential for a stamp duty um, the stamp duty um, uh, stamp duty divot, the stamp duty extension to be extended um, the threshold to be extended beyond the end of March that certainly helped the likes of Taylor Wimpy and Persimmon and look at the share prices obviously there's the original there's the original um, pre and post lockdown plunge since then we've come back around about halfway in the case of taylor wimpy and yet when you actually look at the total completions it's not hard to see why they were down 39 percent um they're down they, they're probably going to be down 39 percent year on year which is not surprising when you saw um, the suspensions that we saw in march and april we can expect to see a recommencement of the dividend starting with the 2020 final dividend um, management haven't completely committed to that and i think it will really depend whether or not they can actually um, match their expectations for 2021 but certainly i think in terms of the rebound taylor wimpy's share price rebound has been a little bit underwhelming if we look at say for example persimmon and Look at their share price rebound. It's probably been slightly more positive. It's certainly rebounded an awful lot more than, say, for example, Taylor Wimpy. Um, and that's because they paid a second interim dividend to 70p in December. So um, the payout is obviously encouraging a few more people to buy into the shares. Forward sales are looking fairly decent. So that, I think, will be a key bellwether for both Persimmon and Taylor Wimpy going forward. As I say, my, all of the there'll be various comments about all of these in my week ahead which you can find on the news and analysis section of the website we've also got um, earnings from prudential and aviva four-year numbers from those two and in the us we've got the likes of zoom um, which has been a big big winner from the pandemic but which is now starting to show signs of a little bit of a slowdown there's the 200 day moving average we're currently bouncing off it we're well down from the highs that we saw in october and i think there are there's big questions being asked about the fact that whether a valuation of around about 120 billion dollars is really um <laughs> is really uh credible for for, for a company that doesn't even turn over a billion dollars a year so um sorry sorry a billion dollars a quarter so um i think that really is the key question when you're turning over less than a billion dollars a quarter is it really credible to have a market cap of around about 120 billion um yes the company's profitable but is it worth what the market's got it valued at and i think this is the this is the question that's being asked by an awful lot of investors about some of these pandemic stocks as i like to call them similar sort of question with respect of room um, which basically allows um, you to buy used cars online that has fairly eye-watering valuation as well i mean we've seen it here in the uk with kazoo um, and the kazoo is talking about going down the ipo route um, spending lots of money on shirt sponsorship in the premier league is kazoo um, and uh, looking to take advantage of the IPO boom that we saw in the US last year and with Vroom. The big difference with Vroom is that it's not making any money. It's losing money, as is its sector peer Carvana. So this market is a very, very challenging one. Ultimately, if I'm going to buy a car, I want to get in it, find out if the gearbox is any good, find out if the brakes are any good. I'm certainly not going to buy it online, even if it is delivered and I've got a seven-day money-back guarantee on it. I want to drive it first. But call me old fashioned. That's probably because I prefer to actually sit in a car before I think about driving it away. Anyway, um, that's um, that's pretty much it for 
this week, ladies and gentlemen. As I say, um, please tune in for non-farm payrolls uh, next week on on the uh, Friday um, for between one and two. Um, we've also got the budget, obviously, on the third of March as well, and those will be the key. But those were two, those will be the the two key items on the agenda, along with OPEC, obviously, on Thursday. Otherwise, thanks very much for listening, ladies and gentlemen. Have a great weekend and speak to you all same time, same place next week. Thanks very much.